Blizzard is worse than you thought. Um, yeah, like I said, the reason I want to watch this is because the title is claiming a lot here. What, like, what do you, what do you mean? From my perspective, before I even start this video, Blizzard has had its ups and its downs. Let's just say, and it's had a lot of downs. But I must say, in the past year, at least the classic WoW dev team with hardcore season of discovery, you know, um. Like the last BlizzCon announcements just seemed really overall hype and they seem to be listening more and they seem to be like going in the right direction, right? So uh, here, seeing this title now instead of like two years ago, I don't know. Let's take a look. Let's see what he has to say. The year is 2023 and a once beloved game developer's reputation is in absolute freefall. What was at one point probably the highest rated developer in the industry? A studio that pumped out classic after classic has now become the home of incomprehensible horror. Corporate greed, broken promises, botched releases, stolen breast milk. <laughs> this breast is milk. the story of Blizzard Entertainment. One of the things that I think about right away with this is that boat analogy. I don't know if you guys have ever heard this, but the analogy is basically if you have a boat and you replace one piece of wood, is it the same boat? And most people are going to say, yeah, it's the same boat. You just replaced one plank. And then it's like, well, what if you replaced 10 pieces of wood? What if you replaced 40? What if you replaced 100? What if you replaced half the entire boat? It's like, is it the same boat? It's like, well, yeah. Then it gets really like interesting philosophically. What if you replace every single piece of wood on the boat? Is it, a, is, it the, is it the same boat? If every single part of it's new, is it the same boat? Or is it a different boat? If it is a different boat, at which point exactly did it become a different boat? Is Blizzard the same Blizzard? If they're not, what point exactly did they change? Ah! Oh! The year is 1991, and three guys have just graduated from the University of California. Alan Adham, Michael Morhaim, and Frank Pierce. They get together to create a game development studio in Irvine called Silicon and Synapse. The name is deeply philosophical and well thought out, with Silicon representing the building block of a computer, and Synapse the building block of a brain. However, people keep mistaking the silicon part for the material in breast implants. Anyway. They spent the first few years porting games to different systems, but soon begin producing their own original games, with The Lost Vikings in 1992 and Rock and Roll Racing in 1993. Eventually, they get sick of constantly being mixed up with women's breasts, so they decide to switch things up, changing their name to Chaos Studios. However, a company based in Florida already has the trademark, and they're now oh, asking F. for $100,000. Oh, come on. Mm. Crap. They then decide to change the studio's name to Ogre Studios. But in 1994, they're acquired by a holding company. Ogre Studios remind me of Pied Piper <laughs> from Silicon Valley. Company for a few <laughs> so million <bad>. dollars. <laughs> and turns out, their new owners aren't a fan of the new name. Okay. So they flip through a dictionary. And, oh my god. Oh, there it is. Blizzard. In 1994, Blizzard releases their first self-published title a real-time strategy game called Warcraft Orcs and Humans, and it's an instant success. It's one of the earliest real-time strategy games to hit shelves, and it's a blast. It also has a modem and LAN multiplayer, meaning people can get together and go ham. And the game does well, selling 100,000 copies in the first year. And for the first time, Blizzard Entertainment is profitable. W. They follow it up with Warcraft 2 in 1995. It's another home run. W. Critically acclaimed, and now selling over a million copies in its first year. Nice. It's now 1996, and a company called Condor Games is looking for a publisher for their nearly complete game, Diablo. Blizzard has a little look, and they like. So they buy them, and rename them Blizzard North. It's also at this point that Blizzard notices something. Warcraft 2 had picked up a lasting online player base, mostly through third-party networks that connected players over this magic new thing called the internet. Wow. So they decide to make their own, Battle.net. Its original functionality is very simple. 
with the ability for players to chat to each other and search for a match. But on December 31st, 1996, it launches alongside Diablo, and people log on and play. Diablo is a massive hit, also selling over a million copies within its first year. In 1998, Blizzard launches StarCraft, an RTS set in space. It sells bigly and quickly grows a massive esports scene. Diablo 2 launches in 2000, another smash hit. <laughs> so many it reaches W's almost 3 million <laughs> sales by the end of the year, becoming the fastest selling PC game of all time. In 2002, Warcraft is back, and now it has an extra dimension. Warcraft 3 sells 1 million units in just one month, immediately becoming the new fastest selling PC game. It also releases with a campaign editor, which spawns a series of popular mods like Defense of the Ancients. And after its expansion in 2003, it's all hands on deck for Blizzard's next project. The year is 2004, oh, the best and year. Blizzard is getting ready to release its biggest mm. game yet. They'd seen how big MMOs like EverQuest were getting and thought they'd try their hand. And after $60 million and five years of work, it's finally nearing release. And in November 2004, World of Warcraft launches. And it takes the world by storm. Did he say $60 million? $60 million to actually make it? I, I didn't realize it was that much to actually to make the, the, the classic... Oh, $6 million. Okay, that sounds actually, right. Actually, even Blizzard's forecast. Six? Okay, that sounds there about right. There are so many players trying to log on in the first week that their servers have a complete meltdown. That was crazy, it's server man. It was crazy. Reaching the thousands. Get past the queues and actually into a game? Well, now you're greeted with a ton of latency issues and a probable disconnection. Meaning you're now back on that queue screen. After the initial server problems are ironed out and people can actually play, the game sucks people in en masse. Fans are very enthusiastic. It hoovers up awards left, right and centre and sells a ton of copies. Reaching almost 6 million sales by the end of its first year. That's so wild. World of Warcraft isn't like your average game though. Instead of simply buying a copy, players have to pay a $15 monthly subscription fee to play. 6 million times 15. Everyone in the chat saying it did say 60 million, 100%. If it was actually $60 million to make Vanilla WoW, I, I'd, I did not know that. That's actually news. Like I, I was thinking, yeah, probably like 5 to 10 for, to making like the initial 2004 version of the game. That's quite the investment, man. It said six. Well, uh, if it said six, that seems reasonable. If it said 60, that's insane, right? And I think that's why a lot of game devs are really, really, really scared, or not devs, but companies are really scared of making MMOs. They take a long time to make, they're very expensive, and most of them fail. You want to invest in my company? You know, like, it's scary, man. It's like, it's, it's like there's so many things going against you. Now, if it's a, if it's a success, you have riches for forever, right? People are addicted. You release expansions. You're in the position of Blizzard with World of Warcraft. It owns, but like it's, yeah. In every month, and Blizzard isn't doing too badly. Everyone is playing the game, and its ads go on to feature a ton of celebrities. I'm Chuck Norris. Oh yeah, I remember these? This game. And others like Vin Diesel, William Shatner, Henry Cavill, Mila Kunis, and Dave Chappelle announce their addictions in various interviews. World of Warcraft is everywhere. God fucking damn it! World of Warcraft would also result in the launch of BlizzCon in 2005, a massive annual convention that would feature big musical acts and announcements for Blizzard's. I was thinking about BlizzCon this morning. I don't know why. I, I didn't go last year because my son was born on November 5th. So that was like two days after, one day after BlizzCon or something. And then three years before that was, was COVID. So there was no BlizzCon either. So I haven't been to BlizzCon. I, I've gone like every year forever. I haven't gone in four or five years or something. I miss it, man. I do. Games. I do. Fans could also ask the devs questions and were sometimes even featured. Leroy! At this point, Blizzard is among the all-time greats of gaming. Every game, a smash hit. They could do no wrong. But first, flying a plane is easy. Just get in, flip a few switches, and you're off. But in War Thunder, it's even easier. 
and a ton of fun. Jump into intense PvP that takes you from the ground to the sea. Oh, this is the ad. This, I was like, wait, what? War Thunder? All the ways <laughs> it's like, disguise. wait a minute. <laughs> In fact, War Thunder is the most comprehensive Maybe I'll play an ad when they're playing an ad. Unbelievable. Time. Just look at yeah. all those things. There's more than 2,000 of them. Someone like, that likes what? the small and agile, or a fan of the more <laughs> voluptuous. Well, War Thunder has something for everyone. The game is deep indeed, with a dynamic wow. damage system that damages individual components wow. and a huge customization system. Hundreds wow. of camos, historical emblems, and over a century of vehicles to pick from. And their models, painstakingly detailed to 100% accuracy, which you can enjoy in gorgeous 4K graphics. And you can play on Xbox, PlayStation, and PC for free. Fancy a large bonus pack with all this stuff? Just sign up through the link in the description or the pinned comments below. There we go. We've seen it. We've seen the advertisement. We're back to the video. Dude, I, I thought I thought War Thunder was, was Blizzard's game. I was like, did I miss that somehow? <laughs> the year is now 2006. Okay. World of Warcraft has almost 10 million active subscribers and oh, is you. bringing in a ton of money. So naturally, it had turned a few heads. One of those heads, Bobby Kotick, CEO of Activision. Now, Damn. in 2006, Activision had made good tracks in just about every genre of games, except one, and one that was now booming, the MMO. With Warcraft currently bringing in over a billion dollars a year in subscriptions alone, he's interested. Now, at this point, Blizzard has changed hands numerous times and is now owned by a company called Vivendi. So Kotick approaches Vivendi with a proposition. Vivendi receives money, Activision receives Blizzard. <laughs> However, Vivendi says no. Instead, Vivendi offers to merge their gaming subdivision with Activision, with Vivendi owning a majority share in the resulting company. And after a brief hesitation from Kotick, in 2008, the deal closes. Activision Blizzard opens its doors with Kotick as CEO, and Activision and Blizzard now its two subsidiaries. Blizzard would supposedly retain most of its autonomy, and keep their CEO, co-founder Michael Morhaim. It's now 2010, and Blizzard has gone from just under 500 employees before the launch of World of Warcraft wild. to now over 4,600, yeah. the majority of whom are preparing for the launch of StarCraft II in July, and the third major Warcraft expansion, Cataclysm, in December. I, I visited the, the Blizzard campus a couple of times in Anaheim. They, they invited us out there many years back, and it's massive. Like, <laughs> dude, it, there's like a whole portion of the campus designed to like just sound. Like there's so many rooms where they just do stuff like, you know, like a perfect like microphone and equipment and like lighting and like f pictures and like artists and like, like it's crazy. Then there's a whole nother part, just like there's just like a park for like dogs and, and a whole nother part for like food, like a whole, whole cafeteria. Like it's a full on, think about like a, like a college campus. It's like a, it's like a massive campus is what it, it, what it, what it is. Yeah. Now these launches were not small. Warcraft had been hitting peak after peak of players and was now at 12 million monthly subscribers. And Starcraft 2's sales projections are also sizable. But Blizzard currently has a problem. Their forums, they're a little bit toxic. Blizzard has a big team of moderators, but according to them, this still wasn't enough. So behind the scenes, they get brainstorming. And someone has a brilliant idea. How about we just force everyone that posts on our forums to use their real first and last name? Oh yeah, no, that's not gonna work. Genius. And in July 2010, real ID is unveiled. And people absolutely hate it. So in an attempt to sell the idea to players, Blizzard's community manager posts his full name on the forum. See guys, it's fine. But almost instantly, people descend on the forum and get to work. And within mere minutes, they find and publish his home address, phone number, yep. age, Not good. Facebook, Not good. family names, and a list of his favorite music and movies. Okay, you know what? Fair enough. And after just a few days of being announced, Not good. Real ID is scrapped entirely. By 2009, the Warcraft 3 mod Defense of the Ancients had gained a significant following and had even spawned a whole new genre of games, MOBAs. For much of that time, Blizzard had paid little attention to the mod or the game. 
but the success of the recently launched League of Legends could no longer be ignored, and Blizzard finally steps in, starting work on their take on the genre, titled Blizzard Dota. Around the same time, <laughs> and Valve wants to make their own MOBA, they'd hired the head dev of the original Dota mod, snapped up the Dota trademark, and they're calling their new game Dota 2. Blizzard is furious. <laughs> So in 2012, they file a statement of opposition, arguing that the name Defense of the Ancients was associated exclusively with Warcraft due to it being made in their map editor. However, this argument has issues. See, the mod was created in Warcraft 3's map editor, but that map editor had no specific terms and conditions on ownership of said maps, IP, and concepts. Oh, they end crap. up settling out of court a few months after, with Valve getting the commercial rights to the term Dota, and Dota 2 releases in 2012. It's massively successful, and goes on to be an esports giant. Blizzard gets non-commercial use of the title for its community, and renames Blizzard Dota to Heroes of the Storm which releases in 2015, and support is canned three years later. Oh, Blizzard would man. change its licensing agreements for all future games to include their ownership of player-created maps in an attempt to avoid this ever happening again. Damn. It's 2012, and the massively anticipated sequel to Diablo 2 is looking like it's releasing this year. It's I think it's really cool what... The community can come up with in terms of game modes like you, you you just heard it there with dota as so cool every time i i rethink of that story um but then you think of it more recently with like hardcore right and hardcore is is as a game mode that the community just kind of wanted to play and you think about it again actually with classic at large right in 2019 classic launch but in 2015 2016 private servers like nostalrius and uh, started with like an E, Illyrium or, or something. There was, there was another one uh, that, that a bunch of people were playing and Blizzard was like, okay, people want this, so let's do it. So like, it's kind of cool that a lot of the times it starts, Ely Elysium, yeah. Um, it starts with a community with people having these ideas. And then I was talking about this the other month in the chat and someone goes like, so what you're telling me is millions of people have better ideas than like hundreds of people working at Blizzard. And it's like, well, yeah, I guess that kind of makes sense, right? Like we have like a hive mind going on here and, a, and like someone's bound to come up with something awesome and then Blizzard can kind of piggyback on that and actually make it a, a reality. This development had been a bit rocky with its dev team, Blizzard North, being canned in 2005 along with their version of the game. But on the 15th of May, 2012, the rebooted Diablo 3 launches. The game is horrendous. For one, its launch is horrific. The game is online only and turns out, there are massive server issues. People are spamming their login details over and over, only to be kicked out by error 37. What's worse, that, there's no queue system in place, so you have to manually retry every minute. Oh, yeah, was, yeah. This issue takes over a week to fix. Then there's the auction house. Here, loot can be bought and sold using your mum's credit card. Activision Blizzard gets filthy rich, while the balancing gets obliterated. Endgame content is also essentially non-existent. However, the game sells almost 4 million copies in its first 24 hours, and over time, slowly makes a turnaround. In 2014, the real money auction house is closed, and Blizzard launches Reaper of Souls an add-on praised almost unanimously. They're ready to make a second add-on to the game, but management says no. Apparently, executives see the game as a massive failure <laughs> and demand devs jump ship. I don't know about you guys, but I, I, I maybe maybe this is just me uh, having like rose-tinted goggles, and it probably is. But when I look about uh, when I look back at the release of Diablo 3, I actually had a lot of fun. I cleared Infernal Diablo on a wizard. Uh, that was kind of, it was difficult, like really challenging, but we got it done. You know, I remember watching Athene, Kriparian, Kungin, and someone else like race to beat it on hardcore first. I, I don't know, I, I had fun. I, I really did have fun. The year is now 2015. Played it for the past like a month or two. Years had yeah, seen I don't massive know. expansions to Warcraft, including controversial changes to the game and its mechanics. And player numbers reflect that, now being in steep decline. A growing number of players long to go back to the days of vanilla, version 1 of the game, back in 2004. 
One fan even floats the idea to Blizzard themselves at BlizzCon 2013. Here's how that goes. Have you ever thought about adding servers for previous expansions as they were then? No. Okay then, oh, we'll just make one ourselves. And the fan-made Nostalria Nost vanilla server yeah, goes Nostalia. online in February 2015. Yeah. Running version 1.12, I played a this. month this after the original launch. It's not long before the server gets massively popular, yeah. with almost a million accounts registered. Yeah. It's also not long before Blizzard catches wind and brings the hammer down. Their lawyers send them a cease and desist in 2016, and the server is promptly shut down. Realizing they were completely wrong about vanilla Warcraft, Blizzard do a full 180 and announce Warcraft Classic in 2017. Yes! I was there in person and I wanted to cry. Back in Literally. 2007, Blizzard started work on a huge MMO called Project Titan. It was described as a combination of Left 4 Dead, Team Fortress, and The Sims. Hmm. But development led nowhere, and six years later, the plug is pulled. F. A massive failure on Blizzard's part, and a major internal embarrassment. However, the team behind it would attempt to rework the remains of the story and assets into another project, and in 2016, Overwatch hits shelves. And it's amazing. It's critically acclaimed across the board, and massively popular, quickly becoming one of the most popular esports titles on the market. That, paired with their genre pioneering card game Hearthstone back in 2014 that now has almost 100 million players, and Blizzard is looking strong. However, there are problems brewing. See, Overwatch was the last big game that had in the pipeline for a while. All right, hold on. I have a, I have a really honest question, and it comes from ignorance, so, so please bear with me. Was Overwatch massively successful because it was a brilliant game? Or was Overwatch massively successful as an esport because Blizzard pumped in tens of millions of dollars into OWL? To me, from an outsider, I thought it was more that it was not like in, as an insane of, of a game, maybe as like, like Counter-Strike or Valorant in terms of FPS titles, but it was pumped in tens of millions of dollars. So it kind of just, I mean, if you have money, you can kind of just get things rolling. That might just be ignorance, right? From the outside. I, I've never, I haven't really played that much Overwatch, but from the outside, once they pulled the money and the funding, the whole thing collapsed, right? And it's like, oh... Was this never strong enough to stand up on its own? Right? And they realize they don't have much to show off for BlizzCon 2018. So Blizzard rushes to find something to show off. Got it. Fast forward to November 2018, and their presentation is ready to go. They sprinkle a few niche announcements here and there, like a remastered Warcraft 3, but they have one big announcement centerpiece. After six long years, a brand new Diablo for mobile. Bruh. Like, look, Diablo 2, come play the mobile game that has nothing to do. Uh... I'm amazed, honestly, it's this bad. This is fucking insane. I, I don't even know, like, what to even say about this. Just was wondering, is this uh, an out of season April Fool's joke? Uh, we don't have any plans at the moment to do a uh, PC. The game eventually tough, launches, bro. and it's bad. <laughs> Firstly, it's not even developed by Blizzard, but their Chinese partner NetEase. And turns out, it's monetized to the tits. It costs over half a million dollars to max out a single character, and becomes the worst rated game ever on Metacritic. By 2018, fans are noticing something. Activision Blizzard had been creeping, and Blizzard was changing. See, back in 2013, Active Blizzard had bought back the remaining Vivendi shares for about $7 billion, Ooh. meaning they, and by extension, Bobby Kotick, now had complete control of both Activision and Blizzard. Fast forward to 2018. He here, here's my take on now this. Now had complete One control second, of both Activision and Blizzard. Here's my take on this, and it, it, it's more of a philosophical take than a than a take of like the actuality of events. But when there's competition, it generally means good things for the consumer. The end consumer generally gets a worse product if there's less competition, 
right? If you have two companies separate, they're fighting to make a better product. Think about like Goku and Vegeta. They're fighting to become stronger. If, 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 if Goku was never there, Vegeta would have never powered up, right? As two separate entities, you have two entities fighting to become stronger, thus offering a better product to the consumer, right? When you have two massive companies combine, they're, they're one, they don't have co that competition anymore and you get a worse end product, right? So generally that's how I think about things. And then with the recent Microsoft purchase, it's like, okay, you know, and, and maybe it'll be good. Maybe it'll be some new thoughts and ideas. Uh, you know, I want to, I want to be an optimist here, but generally that's how I think about it. Right. Fast forward to 2018 and this creeping had only got worse because of the slowdown in game releases, Blizzard's revenues are taking an absolute nosedive. So active Blizzard steps in. It pushes the company to cut costs and gets them to produce games at a faster pace with Kotick apparently installing his own executives within Blizzard to ensure that happens. Oh, this. Apparently, tired of active Blizzard's meddling, Blizzard co-founder Mike Morhaime steps down as president no. and CEO and leaves the company after 27 years of work. He's succeeded by Warcraft's executive producer, J. Allen Brack, this guy. And by the way, you don't want to, that, to do that either. You think you do, but you don't. And as soon as this happens, <laughs> we what a quote. It. The company immediately prioritizes cutting costs, and the Heroes of the Storm's development team is outright annihilated. Its esports league is also scrapped right before its 2019 season. As a result, entire teams, commentators, and support staff are suddenly left jobless. And despite 2018 being a record year for active Blizzard profits, they lay off 800 employees, almost 10% of the company they begin rehiring the exact same jobs a couple of years later. So going into 2019, people are not happy. But turns out, over on the other side of the world, and things are happening in Hong Kong, they're not good. No. Their government has proposed a bill that would give China more authority over them, and that's not too popular. At the same time, Hong Kong native Blitz Chung is participating in Hearthstone's eSports League. I remember this. He wins and uses the post-game interview to show his support for the protests. But as soon as he says it, something happens. See, Blizzard has a huge player base in China, and to keep that player base available to them, they have to bend over backwards for the Chinese government. So when this happens, they go scorched earth. They take the live stream down seconds after he says it, slap him with a year-long ban, and oh even confiscate his prize money. Even the guys casting the scream are fired. It's not long before the internet catches wind, and people are furious. <laughs> At one point, even Congress members have a go. After a few days of pressure, J. Allen Brack eventually comes out. He reduces the ban to half a year and grants Blitz Chung his prize money back. He also says that Blizzard's relationships with China had no influence on their decision. Interesting. Blizzard is starting to look seriously not cool. So they decide to go into BlizzCon 2019 with the big guns, announcing Diablo 4 and Overwatch 2. Also, that Warcraft remaster they'd announced at the infamous 2018 BlizzCon is coming out next year. This'll be good. Back in 2015, Blizzard had set up a subdivision to remaster old games, the first of which would be Warcraft 3. And in January 2020, the highly anticipated remaster launches. And Oh boy, the game is beyond terrible. Here's why. Before launch, Warcraft 3's advertising touted multiple new features. Over four hours of cinematic new cutscenes, more story, and new voice acting. And a complete campaign overhaul, changing the story to be more in line with the current Warcraft I lore. never played Warcraft 3 But when players mastered. log on, turns out absolutely none of this is in the game. This is after being advertised on the website for over a year. Liar! There's also a ton of features from the original Warcraft 3 just outright missing. Here are a few of them. No ranked play. No. No profiles. Uh, no. No account stats. Uh, no. Bro. No custom campaign. No. I never no heard about clans. this. That's no. not good. No cross-region <laughs> play for custom games. Um, no. And no offline play. <laughs> no. It's possible after a few patches, but it's a little complicated. Also, after some digging, people realize the main menu background is actually a Chrome-based web app, 
and is taking up more of your CPU power than the actual game. Online oh matchmaking gosh, sucks bro. and kicks you out all the time. This is without a way to reconnect, by the way. Graphics are worse than advertised. Treason! Have you lost your mind, Arthas? The new art direction is bad. Five of the game's maps are exactly the same as the original, and poor optimization, v, tons baby. of crashes, and countless bugs. On top of all of that, Reforged is a mandatory update for everyone with the original game. Own the original with no intention of upgrading? Well, here's an additional 30 gigabytes of install size anyway. All of this amounts to one of the worst launches of a game in history. Within a few days of release, it ends up at 0.5 out of 10 Ooh. on Metacritic. At the time, the lowest Metacritic score in history, wow. before being dethroned by Diablo Immortal. So naturally, hordes of people pile in to request refunds. But wait, you've booted up the game even just once? Sorry, you're not allowed. There's so much outcry about the game, however, that Blizzard eventually caves and starts actually granting refunds. Oh well. The game is so bad that the entire classic games division of Blizzard is completely canned. You're fired! Get out of here! It also causes an upcoming Diablo 2 remake to be pushed back more than a year. So it's 2021, and Blizzard's reputation is currently abhorrent. But luckily, Overwatch 2 is just around the corner. Hold on a sec. Oh god. Turns out that over the last two years, the California Civil Rights Department had been investigating uh -oh. Activision Blizzard due to multiple reports of sexual harassment oh, yeah. for staff. Yeah. And by July 2021, they had enough evidence I to file about that suit. For a second. The oh, lawsuit man. states that sexual harassment, unwanted advances, and groping are common within Blizzard, both before and after the merge. This includes the mention Not of good. an executive suite at 2013's BlizzCon. It's not a nice place. In fact, some employees literally dub it the Cosby Suite. Then there's the alleged Shit. underpaying of women, and complaints to both HR and the president repeatedly being ignored. But there was something else. The employee's breast milk. Oh, right. It Gosh. keeps being stolen. Dude. In the lawsuit, more than one employee alleges breast milk theft. Unbelievable. It was very clearly breast milk, in baggies with a baby's face on it, a form of producer claims. One day, I went to retrieve my pump supply at the end of the day, and it was gone. Bruh. The fallout is monumental, and makes headlines industry-wide. Few people are spared. Current Diablo 4 lead? Gone. His character's name in Overwatch? Also gone. Level designer on World of Warcraft? Gone. Head of HR? Definitely gone. Warcraft League? Gone. J. Allen Br Gone. Their chief legal Gone. The Wall Street Journal also alleges that Kotick knew about the whole thing, ignored it, and in some cases, even jumped in himself. He denies most of the allegations, I did not. but eventually apologizes for a one-time instance where he left a voicemail threatening to have his assistant killed. That's all fine then. Water Jeez. under the bridge. Sponsors like T-Mobile, Coca-Cola, Kellogg, IBM and Pringles also all jump ship <laughs> from the Overwatch Esports League. And Activision Blizzard is hit with a class action lawsuit Whoa. on behalf of its shareholders. What? Overall, the situation's not looking great. Activision Blizzard denies most of the claims, and in June 2022... People are wondering why female employees store breast milk at work. Okay, the reason they do that is because breasts fill up with milk and you have to uh, pump the milk, especially if the baby's not there to drink the milk or else you uh, start experiencing pain, okay? And if you don't do it for long enough, then the milk dries up. So if you're at work after like three or four months, you're back at work, but the baby's still breastfeeding and the baby's at home or at, at, at daycare, you have to pump to store that milk, one, for later, so your baby has something to eat, and two, uh, because if not, it's going to be painful and your uh, your breast milk dries up. Uh, and not judging here, if you didn't know that, you probably just uh, haven't had a baby, which is fine. So, uh, so that's how that works. They investigate themselves and find no wrongdoing. The immediate reaction to Overwatch 2's announcement was one of confusion. 
Overwatch 1 was a monetized game with a thriving player base and regular updates. The kind of game that doesn't need a sequel. So this was a strange move. Overwatch 2's development would also mean the end of support for Overwatch 1 in 2020, with us seeing no new Overwatch content for multiple years, essentially killing the game. What? But with Overwatch 2, Blizzard reassures us it was all worth it. Just look at all this new stuff. 5v5 instead of 6v6, shiny new graphics, balancing changes, map reworks, 6 new maps, 3 new heroes, more than 30 new skins, Sheesh. a new game mode, a battle pass and cosmetics it's shop, gonna be insane. and most importantly, a PvE campaign. People had been longing for a story in the Overwatch universe, and now it was finally happening. And it was ambitious. Blizzard shows off a full campaign, along with hero missions, talents, and massive skill trees unique to each hero. Hundreds of missions at launch, they announce. A truly replayable campaign. And don't worry, with Overwatch 2, Blizzard tells us they were redefining what a sequel really means. Overwatch 1 players get all the new maps, updates, and heroes that release in Overwatch 2, and both player bases can cross-play together. The purchase of Overwatch 2 essentially only granting the PvE mode. Okay, sold. Players are on board. 10th of March 2022, and Blizzard has an announcement. Look, we know we said hundreds of missions at launch, but, well, it's taking a while, so we're just going to release the game now without it, and add it later. Then in June, they come out again. The game's now free to play, and launching in October. But anyway, on the 4th of October 2022, it goes live. There are some issues. Events are bad, tons of balancing issues, the looking for group feature is now just completely gone. But mainly, there's the new cosmetic system. In Overwatch 1, earning cosmetics was simple. Just play the game, level up, and earn loot boxes that give you skins. You could pay for them, but that was completely optional. In Overwatch 2, things are different. Blizzard has now slapped on a seasonal battle pass system, where the bulk of cosmetics would now be unlocked. There's also a rotating store, and the prices there aren't great. You can unlock skins for free through the challenge system, but there's a problem. It takes about 8 months to get one. A oh simple character recolor takes almost 4 weeks. All of this means that it will take you around 327 years yeah. to get all the stuff well you could swipe. get relatively quickly for free in Overwatch 1. Better get playing. Also, Damn. there's now a new hero every other season, and they'd be locked behind the later levels of the season pass. So your you options the are okay. spend every minute of your life grinding for them, or pay up. Give me money. In Overwatch 1, Damn. they were unlocked straight away. Fans don't take kindly to these changes. But then in May 2023, Blizzard comes out again. So, that <laughs> PvP hero campaign that we've been advertising, and was pretty much the sole reason we made the sequel in the first place, pretty much completely scrapped. Uh. No more talent trees or hero missions. Instead, uh. we're just gonna pepper some PvE missions around every few seasons. What? <laughs> Wait a minute. What the f This was essentially the entire selling point for the sequel. Some of the remaining story content is still planned, with its first release on August 10th, but when it finally releases, it's only three missions. Blizzard is saying the game won't be getting any more story missions until at least 2024. Hey, that's they our also year. add Overwatch 2 to Steam, and it instantly becomes the worst reviewed game of all time there. Man, that's tough. The year is now 2023, and Blizzard's reputation has never been worse. So when Diablo 4's release approaches, people are cautious. But on the 5th of June, the game launches, and it's surprisingly good. There are some issues here and there, but reviews are mostly positive, and over 10 million people log in and play, making Diablo 4 Blizzard's fastest selling game of all time. Really? For the okay. first time in years, things are actually looking up. And this game was live service, meaning it would receive free seasons of content for the foreseeable future, the first of which was launching in July. Uh -oh. A month later, and in July, season one of the game drops. It is disastrous. Oh, God. And Reddit goes into the complete <laughs> oh, God. Turns out, everything gets a big nerf, including the Metacritic score. The Sorcerer class, which was already underpowered, is hit especially hard. Then there's the enemies being overpowered, much less XP, 
a bunch of reskinned dungeons and enemies. I, I have a theory where when you're making a game and everything is strong, uh, or, or a couple things are, are really strong, and then like some things are weak, it's generally a better idea to buff the weak classes first and see where see where you end up than to nerf the strong ones. The reason I feel that way is because at the end of the day, you can all end, you can end up with all the classes feeling kind of subpar, or you could end up with all the classes feeling really good. And if you have all the classes feeling really good, you have a great game because everyone feels like they're owning, even if they're not necessarily owning. And I think League of Legends has done that very well, like especially back in the day. If you ask like your friend Jeff, like, hey, Jeff, how you doing in League? He's like, oh, man, I own, you know, and it's like. Maybe he's not actually owning, but he thinks he's, he feels like he's owning. I think that feeling is important for a successful video game. But when you start nerfing all these classes and maybe you're actually kind of highly performing, but it feels like you're not doing anything because your class just feels like it sucks. It's not a good feeling for a game uh, player, right? It's not a good feeling for the player. So yeah, buff the week. Barely any new content and zero quality of life changes. Everything here is wrong. <laughs> One streamer on Twitch tries to explain why the season isn't that bad. Here's how that goes. Explosion is at... I actually just lost my hardcore character while trying to explain this to you. I changed my mind. I hate this season. And it seems Blizzard also has a bit of a fixation on the... Battle pass. Battle pass. Uh, battle pass. Battle, battle pass. pass. Battle pass. Battle pass. Speaking of which, it gives paid players 666 platinum. The cheapest item in the store is 800. Also, back when Blizzard was designing the menus for the game, they decided to place the Activate Premium Battle Pass button right next to the button you're constantly pressing to see your season progression. Ooh, that's kind of small. There's also no Dude. confirmation button, Dude. so if you want to check your progression and accidentally misclick, congratulations, you've just purchased it. Oh, man. There are multiple other confirmation buttons for other menu options in the game. Oh, that's tough. So Blizzard's last few years haven't been great. Somehow, Blizzard is now worse than Bethesda! It had slowly become oh, clear to people. With overreach from Activision, more fiscal concern, and most of the original talent having left the company, among other things. Maybe Blizzard wasn't the company it once was. And after a back-to-office mandate in 2023, even more talent is leaving. So much talent that Blizzard is now actually creating crisis maps for what content they can and can't get done. But with the acquisition from Microsoft, who's currently focusing on making good exclusives to slap on their Game Pass, some fans are hopeful for change. But for now, the outlook on Blizzard Entertainment remains bleak. And don't forget about the epic accuracy. Oh yeah, and the ad. Okay, I'm actually kind of surprised like if you're gonna if you're gonna hate on blizzard for all the stuff they did wrong and trust me there's plenty of it you gotta applaud them when they do well and we didn't talk at all about season of discovery about hardcore servers like there, there's been some w's the past year like i started the video off now i agree with all of this historically there's been some ups and there's definitely been some downs but i will say this past year in terms of the classic wow dev team I think Josh has been doing a great job. There's like a, a numerous other players on the classic dev team that have been doing like a really, really great job. So I, I want to commend them for doing well. In fact, for the Warcraft IP, I think the biggest problem that Blizzard has right now is satisfying a multitude of player bases that are, are, are scattered across different WoW IP game modes. You have players that are like, playing self-found hardcore, normal hardcore, Season of Discovery, Wrath of the Lich King, which is soon to be Cato, then Retail, uh, Raiding, Mythic Plus, and, and PvP. Like, there's just so many categories within the, the broader category of Warcraft, and everyone's asking for different things, and Blizzard's, I think Blizzard's biggest problem right now is being pulled in a million different directions. Like, give me this, give me that, give me that, and there's so many different consumers fighting over a different... Um, uh like a different ask from blizzard that's tough to manage that's tough to handle right it's a good problem to have because there's a lot of people that are massive fans of the warcraft universe of warcraft ip but it's it's tough because everyone's like yelling at each other saying retail 
uh, is dead. Sod is dead. Hardcore is dead. Wrath is dead. This sucks. That sucks. And like, it, it feels like at this point, the, the Warcraft community is very, very divided. So it's like really good that you have so many people that love your game, but it's really tough that the community is so divided because of the many iterations of the Warcraft universe. Okay. I guess a lot of this stuff we knew. I'm, I'm happy we watched this because it was just a good video laid out really well. It was, it was like a, a little documentary on the last, uh, geez, 30 years of Blizzard. Actually, some of the stuff in the, at the start of the video I didn't know with uh, like those, those initial kind of uh, names they had before they named it Blizzard. So yeah, pretty cool. Yo, thanks for linking that in the Reddit, man.